So good evening all. My name is Aganja and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to LEAP, Learn from Professionals, organized by Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Center of Christ College of Engineering. Christ College of Engineering, established in 2015, is a new entrant in the field of professional education providers. The college is managed by the CMI congregation of Devmada province, Trishur, and and as a part of the Christ Educational and Charitable Trust in Alakuda. I extend heartfelt welcome and gratitude to our Executive Director, Father John Palyekara, our Joint Director, Father Joy, and the Captain of our ship, Principal Dr. Sajeev John. I also extend welcome to all Kerala Startup Mission officials present. Special appreciation and greetings to the Nodal Officer of our IEDC cell, Rahul Manoharso. Also welcome our C CEO of IEDCCC, Mohammed Ashik. The Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Cell, IEDC, aims to inculcate and strengthen the entrepreneurial quality and motivation necessary to develop knowledge and skills among members of IEDC. We aim to impart basic managerial knowledge and understanding which helps students to formulate effective innovative and profitable projects. LEAP is a much awaited sequel to our greatly celebrated event, Date with an Entrepreneur, where we provided you with a platform to meet a new entrepreneur and you to get his, her or her roller coaster ride of success and failure. The IEDC cell of CC has always been one of the most active organizations with innovative and vibrant events being its trademark. And this time, IEDC brings you LEAP, a five-day event with sessions on prime topics being handled by experienced professionals and academicians in the industry. It's the fourth day of LEAP, and I'm really excited to have a wonderful personality with us. First of all, I'm really grateful to the IEDC and Krishna Prasad for bringing such an eminent personality as the resource person of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, to discuss on the topic, Breaking into the gaming industry, we have Mr. Bharat Prabhagaran, developer at the King. Heartily welcome to you, sir. So now I invite the chair of the session, Justin Sir, Christ College of Engineering, to the session. Thank you. Uh, a warm good evening to one and all gathered here. I'm great pleasure to introduce our today's guest. Bharat Prabhagaran sir. He was working in the gaming industry for the past 10 years. He developed the games across different platforms like iOS, Android, Windows and currently working as a developer at King Games. Very happy to you on today's section and also to hear more about the gaming industry. Welcome you sir. Thank you. Uh, can you guys see me? Hear me? Yes. Yes, yes sir. You're audible. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am by no means an eminent personality, but, but yes, I do have a fair bit of time. I uh, do have a fair bit of experience making games, which I would like to share with you guys today. So I would like to share my screen now. So let me figure this out. Okay. Yes, OS X does not let me share my screen. So please give me a moment I'll, while I fix this. Can you see my screen? No, sir. It is not visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It can. It is visible. Uh, am I presenting the right screen? I, why doesn't this show give me any feedback? <laughs> Aha, there it is. Yes. So, yep, this is the right screen. Yep. 
So now that we got that out of the way, we can get on with it. Okay, so my name is Bharat Prabhakaran, and today we're talking about games and the game development industry in general. So yes, today we'll be talking about an intro to the game development industry. We'll go go we'll talk about the industry in general, and then we'll talk about different roles within each company, what goes into making a game into making a game, the different kinds of programming roles, the different hats programmers wear within the game development industry. So yeah, first let's let me start with me and how my career started and how things uh, are going at the moment. So I started my career in 2011. Uh, back then, Steve Jobs is still alive. The iPhone 4 was the latest iPhone to have come out. Uh, games that were doing well at that point, as far as mobile games were concerned, were uh, Angry Birds. Uh, what else? Oh, let's see. Angry Birds, uh, Tiny Wings, Cut the Rope, Where's My Water, etc. So Apple had just released the Retina displays. So the pixel density on these devices were so good that games on mobile phones, they just looked incredible compared to how they used to look before. Uh, so that, that, those are one of the first technical challenges that we actually faced. Uh, moving from low res or uh, low uh, pixel density textures to high high pixel density textures and getting the game to look as good as it can on a new device. It, it was a very exciting time back then. Uh, so over the years, the mobile industry, just the mobile industry, it has expanded and uh, it's gotten to a point where everybody can play a game on their phones considering the current devices that people have access to. So uh, it's a very good time to be a mobile developer. But we're not here to just talk about the mobile industry. Uh, I will give you uh, an overview into an overview, basically, of how the industry works in general also. So OK, so this is what the uh, breakup looks like. As you can tell, this was in 2019. And $152 billion is a lot of money. It's an incredible amount of money. Just to put things in perspective, uh, Hollywood is, I think, 130 or somewhere over there. So there is a lot of money in this industry. It's something that's just written off as, as you know, games are just child's play and uh, it's just playing. So that is not the case. That's not the reality at all. Uh, so these are the numbers. These are slightly outdated in that this was in 2019. Games had a pretty good year this year and last year. So with the pandemic, a lot of people have been sitting at home and just you know playing games. Uh, one other estimate that I saw was that it was touching 180 billion. So there is a lot of money in games. And as a result, it's a very lucrative uh, business opportunity for a lot of startups and whatnot. So let's get into the game dev industry in general. Uh, you have, but we're going to look at the game dev industry by platform, right? So consoles. Consoles are, uh, in case you don't know what a console is, uh, the PlayStation 5 that was released just a while ago and the Xbox Series X. These are what we call consoles. But this is what uh, game development is traditionally associated with. Uh, what games are usually associated with. Uh, when you picture somebody playing games, it's usually somebody on a couch with a controller, right? But uh, yes, and things are, things have been, it's been an, an incredibly good year for consoles also, uh, with, play, with Sony reporting some of the highest revenue in a console launch year this year. Despite there being a global silicon crisis and a uh, global shortage of silicon and nobody's able to get any of the electronics because of the pandemic. So the console industry is probably the oldest game development industry or game development platform per se. Next we have mobile. Uh, maybe we should start with PC first. PC, uh, rather, we should probably go to PC next. So uh, PC games, are, this is the other 
platform that's traditionally associated with uh, games. Uh, and now we have mobile uh, with the advent of 3G and 4G and being able to download vast huge amounts of data relatively cheaply and Android and uh, iOS devices being relatively cheaper and accessible. Uh, the mobile gaming industry has just boomed as I've shown you uh, a couple of slides ago. So that's still a huge chunk considering that this is an industry that was virtually non-existent like 12, 13 years ago. So the, these are the primary platforms that we associate game development with, uh, with games, associate gaming with. But you also have cloud gaming, which is like a new trend. Uh, it's something that uh, is maybe a little too early to talk about this maybe, but uh, maybe a little too early to the market considering broadband speeds, but what the concept of cloud gaming is, is basically you don't do any of your uh, calculations, any of the computation on your device. You just need a display, a small uh, device that can plug into the internet that is actually connected to your display and you just need a controller. That is the premise. Your inputs are sent to this little device, which is which then talks to the network, which then talks to the uh, cloud, which has a separate server running the game. And then they do all the processing there. And they bring back and it's just give you the visuals. So this eliminates the need to own uh, even a heavy console or a PC. You just need, I think uh, Google Stadia's implementation just involved a Chromecast. And that was uh, really uh, quite an achievement. But of course, with uh, anything this uh, futuristic, broadband speeds are definitely a bottleneck. And the experience has been a little shaky if you don't, uh, the experience can be a little shaky if you don't have right internet speeds. Uh, and then, of course, you have standalone VR. Uh, virtual reality is something that has captured uh, the minds of any sci-fi lover from, from for decades now. But it's always been a sector that's always been up and coming. Uh, recently, there were like very, uh, you know, giant steps taken towards accessible VR when uh, Facebook when Oculus actually uh, announced the Rift and there, were, there was a HTC Vive. But those all relied on PC and console, cons oh, mostly on PCs, yeah. They relied on beefy PCs being able to uh, render two different images for your eyes and being able to do that at 120 hertz. But uh, more recently, Facebook has, Facebook, which now owns Oculus, has uh, released the Quest and the Quest 2, which are basically standalone VR headsets that basically run Android on it, and you just don't, uh, need a different system. All the computation is just handled directly on your face, literally on your face. Uh, so that is that has made VR a, an open market right now. So there are quite a few players that are uh, into VR for as both hardware vendors and as uh, developers who focus on standalone VR titles. Uh, OK, so this is basically just a little intro to the game development industry and what the different platforms are and stuff. So but what actually goes into making a game? So you, it's, uh, you are trying to ship an experience packaged as software, basically, right? So you want the players to experience something, but the vessel that you actually deliver this experience in is actually software. So it starts with an idea, and uh, it's usually we have we have like game designers who have come up with a specific game mechanic, which which is still just ideas on paper, right? You need to transform that to software. It's a huge process. Uh, so these guys are the ones who come up with uh, mechanics. By mechanics, I mean th doing this is what. Uh, Mechanics are basically the little things that you actually do within the game. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a, that, that's definitely a better way to describe it, but uh, that's that basically uh, might sum up mechanics for now. But so everything you do within the game, right? These guys are the ones who visualize it, who who come up with this idea for what should go into a game. Uh, and a lot of games, if you if you've ever played an RTS uh, or 
something like uh, uh, for I don't I don't know why I can't really think of anything right now. But yeah, you have economy designers actually designing economies. Uh, even something as uh, simple as a mobile game will have will have to create a deficit between how much is actually rewarded to the player versus how much the player spends so that the player actually needs to go and buy stuff. So all that does go into design. So it's all contained there. Uh, the next bit is art. So which is basically everything and anything that you see within the game is, uh, is done by artists. So that it's very uh, it's very uh, unusual for programmers to have anything to do with the visuals, but in most cases, it is in almost uh, ninety five percent of the cases, it's actually artists who are uh, coming up with uh, UI design, actual three D models that go into the game, particle effects, etc. Uh, and then you have programmers, which is us. So what we do is putting together design and art into software that's actually playable, something that you can actually run on a device. And that is basically what programming does. And just shrinking things down and just simplifying, oversimplifying things maybe. But that's basically what happens there. Uh, next is QA. Now, QA is uh, quality assurance. Uh, testing is basically what QA uh, uh, encompass it. So basically what you have is you have something that you've actually put together and then you have to see if this actually does what was expected by the designer. So that is a huge process of uh, actually going from design to actually making it into the game. Uh, and QA can, uh, they're not just there to, you know, figure out what, what bugs are in the game or whatever. They're, they're also there to ensure that the experience that is delivered to the player is consistent with what the designers had in mind. Uh, that QA is something that's, again, written off as uh, it's just play testing. We just need to play the game before we release. Anybody can do that. Absolutely not. Uh, with a uh, few recent releases that we've seen, uh, I, I don't want to take names, but yeah, some we've seen some very, very broken name, broken games that have come out last December. Yeah, and then this is uh, something else that you don't really see. That this, it's not tangible, but it's actually very crucial to game development. So you have the whole process of going from design to QA, uh, to design to uh, within the game. But somebody has to keep track of whether the game will actually ship on time. So production manages that. So these guys are usually people who are uh, ex ex who are very experienced uh, designers, programmers, or QA guys who know the whole process of shipping a game. And they ensure that the game is delivered on time. So you, you tend to have the executive producer who makes executive decisions for most of these, who makes executive decisions for the game as far as the game's direction is concerned. And then you will have different producers working with designers, artists, and smaller teams within the company. Uh, apart from this, these next two bits are fairly new to game development in general. So, uh, data science. So we do have quite a few data science scientists who find uh, who are crucial to our uh, success. So data science is something that's actually incredibly crucial to our success. Reason being, uh, with with games uh, in the recent past, uh, we focus on analytics. So we know what the user likes. We know what. We can tell what the user might like. We can tell what the user might not like. So nothing, there are no accidents here. So you, you test something and then you say, okay, the users don't really like this, A few, but the, this group of users actually likes this. Then you can actually release it into, into the game. Uh, so data science is something that is finding increasing relevance in game development today. And then of course with, uh, with the advent of social media, you also have community management. You have people streaming on Twitch, people streaming on YouTube. You have people who talk about games, influencers. Somebody has to reach out to them and get uh, get the game out there, get them to handle a little bit of marketing there. But uh, and also, 
that is a trend of actually listening to your players and making games better. That is basically what community management usually uh, involves. So these are the different, uh, you know, high level crafts that actually go into game development. So if you thought it was just programming or if it was just, uh, you know, uh, art being able to create 3D models, no, there is so much more to game development than just any one of these crafts. Uh, so yes, now we, we can go uh, into a little bit more detail into uh, game programming in general, right? So the first bit that I want to talk about is gameplay programming. Uh, if you've ever played a game with, that has lots of missions and stuff, so these guys are the ones who actually designed those systems. So you will be, uh, you will be scripting different uh, things that happen, occurrences within the game. So something triggers something else. But, uh, and in, in addition to that, you will also be working on systems like uh, combat systems. Or in this case, uh, if you, if anybody's played Zelda Breath of the Wild, that is a very beautiful uh, chemistry system that lets you, that lets you cook things. So you find a lot of these ingredients in the wild, you put them together, and then they give you something that actually uh, that they give you something that you can actually use. So the way they interact with one another, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's absolutely astounding how they've managed to pull off such a system. But yes, and that system sort of ties into other systems within the game. And this is all just, uh, you could just call it a, the pinnacle of system design when it comes to uh, game development. I'm talking about uh, this specific uh, system in, in Zelda. Uh, so you might have, you might walk into a room in a game and you want a bunch of things to happen. All that is actually handled by the gameplay programmers at your, uh, Valve or, uh, Rockstar. So moving on. Audio programming. So this is a slightly more rather, uh, discipline, I want to say. Uh, so these guys are the ones who are responsible for the whole uh, audio asset pipeline and being able to play the right audio file uh, in real time, depending on what happens within the game. So again, these guys, they interface with different, uh, different other systems, such as, say, if you're walking, you want to play the right walking sound. You might be walking on grass. You, want, you might be walking on a solid surface. Uh, so the sound you play has to change in real time from one to, from one to the other. You might have walked into a slightly echoey room. So that has the reverb and everything has to be updated there. So these guys are incredibly good with uh, being able to tweak sound at the waveform level. So they, they are like uh, DSP geniuses and whatnot. But uh, again, depending on the company you work for and what you're expected to do, the role usually varies quite a bit. Uh, if you played something like uh, Hellblade, Cinema Sacrifice, or uh, some of these horror games that involve a lot of uh, ambient sounds and setting the mood, uh, these guys are, uh, you know, fundamentally important to actually being able to uh, do that right. Moving on. AI programming. Uh, so this is something that I used to do a bit back in the day. So uh, AI is basically what you expect uh, an NPC or something else in the game to actually, an NPC or an enemy, or it can also be other things in the game to actually react to the player and your actions. Uh, so uh, going back, Halo, when Halo Combat Evolved, the first well, was the first game to actually implement something called behavior trees, right? So instead of having all these behaviors and everything in code, what they did was they created the, this beautiful visual tool, right? Which just go, which just went from one state to another, you, and you could actually visually see this and debug the states, the state transitions, and everything. Uh, so, which is why it, the AI that uh, Halo was. Uh, associated with was just praised immensely. And today we use uh, behavior trees even in real world AI applications. Uh, 
like in robotics as well that they have like a software module that runs a behavior tree and selects things selects the right behaviors so just to give an example so this is uh this is probably what it might look like so you have like a sequencer so it, you just go from left to right or right to left or whatever but here uh depending on the ai your behavior tree implementation so here you have actions right it could be is the player within range if so fire is the player outside of range then get into range and then fire this will also work with uh, other systems right so this is just something that determines what it should do so there might be a pathfinding system which then would then just uh, handles the motion or whatever so yeah this is uh, what ai programmers mostly do these days they do spend a lot of time building behavior trees big elaborate behavior trees uh so yes and apart from this uh uh game ai is infamous for uh it has uh, there are other reasons why game, game ai is infamous uh, there was if you remember uh, there was this uh, I, I know most of you are too young to remember this but uh deep blue i think the name was of the a robot that actually beat a uh, chess grandmaster at chess so uh, game ai has come a long way from just chess to this and uh, of course in more recent they, uh, the more recent years uh elon musk's company open ai they uh, put together bots for dota that can even beat the biggest uh, biggest group uh, the biggest teams in the world uh, so ai it has come a long way from just uh, frogger and uh, space invaders ai to incredibly elegant and complex ai I can move on now uh ui programming so the ui the user interface can either make or break the game for a for, for a user uh you might have an amazing game but if everything everything else that lets you interact with the different elements in the game is absolutely terrible then you're probably going to not uh pick up the game ever again uh just to give you an example say if you're playing a uh a shooter and you have to loot very quickly and the ui is broken and if you are forced to drag and drop things then it's just not a very good experience now ux and ui i'm sorry uh, ui programmers they usually work with uh the ux designers directly to implement their vision of what the ui should be you can have something as simple as very basic ui to incredibly complex ui like what you see, what you guys can see on screen um apart from this uh yeah that's i think we can move on now yes network programming uh network programming is something that is very close to my heart because i did spend a bit of time doing that also so this is a fairly challenging bit of uh programming that uh, involves basically ensuring that everybody who is playing a multiplayer game get has a very good experience so information cannot travel to everyone simultaneously so if you are you are limited by things like the uh, route your packet takes your uh, ping your general quality of your network if you're losing too many packets so what happens then is you have to compensate for all of this on the client so you do have to predict where the user might be predict where the user might have been and uh, extrapolate and it's a very interesting and challenging job uh there are alternatives to this where and again depending on the kind of game you're making the problem set also changes significantly uh there is a brilliant paper that uh that i think the i think the title is uh, 20000 arrows over a 56k modem and this was about how age of empires the original age of empires pulled off proper multiplayer with over a 28 Uh, 56k network 
Uh, so the problem sets that network programming involves is not just uh, you know ensuring that you're implementing the right protocol or the or the, the pro or the, the uh, packets arrive on time everywhere. It's also about uh, ga making game specific implementations, game specific solutions for your network issues. Tools programming. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, not everybody is a programmer who, and not everybody can actually make changes to what needs to be shipped. At the end of the day, you are going to be shipping software, but there are lots of non, uh, non-code related things that need to be able to change. And tools programmers sort of make this, uh, sort of make those changes accessible to everyone. So you might have a designer who might want to make a few tweaks for this or that. So you, it might be a tool programmer who might uh, have come up with a specific tool that made things easier. And frankly, it's not just for you know democratizing changes to the game either. Uh, it could be profiling the game. It could be uh, basically seeing how much memory your uh, game is taking and uh, where the allocations are happening, where your textures are being used, these can all this can be visualized uh, with a specific tool. So you, you can have your gameplay programmers and your system designers just do, do their thing, and the overhead of actually being able to visualize what the impact of those programming decisions are can be uh, outsourced to these guys who will then come up with a tool that can just let you see what's happening inside. Uh, okay. What else? Level editors. Uh, when people think of tool programmers, the first thing to think of is level editors. But yeah, and, and I'm sure if you've, if you've played around with some of the level editors that used to ship with games back in the day, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, moving on. Build engineering. So uh, the way we work in companies in uh, game dev these days is it's not a straight forward waterfall model. Uh, it's not like you, we, we plan, we test, I'm sorry, it's not like we plan, we implement the plan, and then we go ahead and uh, test it, see if there are bugs, and then fix those bugs and then ship it. No. Uh, what happens is it's, 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 it's a lot more uh, scientific in a way. So first you hypothesize a change, and then you implement the change, and then you observe the change. And this involves a fair bit of builds that go into uh, into this process. So you will, you, if to be able to observe and test your changes, uh, you will need a constant uh, frequency at which builds are released, builds are created, sorry, uh, for internal testing. And sometimes, uh, we, sometimes we have companies that have games as a service uh, releasing patches every few uh, weeks or months. And for them also, it's a very crucial aspect. Uh, so build engineers, they are usually, they, they're usually incredibly uh, good at setting up uh, Jenkins and working with Jenkins. And uh, Jenkins is a tool that lets you, lets you set up a proper CI CD pipeline and uh, what else? Yeah, so that's basically what build engineers do. And uh, to be honest, uh, something like agile would be totally, uh, would be pro probably very hard to implement without build engineer without good build engineers. Uh, moving on, yep. So uh, now we can talk a little bit about engine programming. So all these guys, right? All the others, they basically work with something called a game engine, which is basically a pre-built set of tools that they can use to work with. Uh, Engine programmers are usually incredibly uh, focused on what they do. The things they work with are very, uh, the work they do is incredibly uh, crucial in, to the success of the game. Because one small change in the engine can easily cause your entire game to fail catastrophically. Uh, but uh, these guys are also responsible for both what you see on the game and how the game uh, the physics in the game and also different other systems also. But right now we'll talk about 
uh, a couple of interesting bits, which is the physics that goes into games and the graphics designers, the I'm sorry, graphics programmers, the who designed the guys who designed the rendering engines. So I'm not sure if uh, you've seen this, but if you've had a chance to play The Last of Us 2, uh, that is an incredible implementation of rope physics. The way the rope actually moves around and the way it interacts with the environment, as you can see here, it's it's just, it, it was mind blowing when, it, when most developers first saw it. I think a lot of people are still talking about this. Uh, so this is only possible because they had extremely good physics uh, in, physics engineers, uh, physics programmers. So this is uh, a testament to uh, the fact that at the end of the day, you are really trying to replicate the how how the real world works inside software. So yes, uh, moving on. Graphics programmers. Uh, these guys are also an incredibly talented bunch of people. Uh, so what you're seeing on screen is this incredibly well-made uh, VR game called Half-Life Alex, And this has some of the best visuals on a VR game ever. But what you're seeing right now specifically is the implementation of a liquid shader. The liquids here, have uh, they, they, they don't really, uh, they've been implemented by shaders, meaning all the, pro all the effects that you're seeing is happening directly on the GPU. So it's, it, it, and this is like one of the best implementations of liquid physics that I've ever come across. Uh, and to see this in VR is quite a surreal experience. Uh, so graphics programmers are usually the ones who design, who uh, design the rendering pipeline and implement that for the game. Uh, they ensure that uh, irrespective of what GPU you're using, your game renders properly. But by rendering, I mean it just draws everything that you see on on screen properly, that you're supposed to see on screen properly. Uh, these guys, they are incredibly good at uh, shader programming, which is, again, uh, shaders are very small programs that actually run on the GPU directly. Uh, but yeah, these guys are incredibly good at writing shaders and de dealing with shaders and uh, different uh, uh, different rendering APIs also. So yes, and if you're interested in rendering and stuff, there are quite a few. Uh, I think there's one YouTuber that I came across who makes the whole process of run, uh, building a game engine per se a little bit more accessible. I think his name is The Journal, and he does a CPP series, and he's, he sort of uses what he's uh, taught in CPP series to actually build a programming engine. I'm sorry, a uh, game engine. Moving on. And then you have the generalists. Uh, this is what most companies expect you to be, meaning you don't need to have in-depth knowledge in any of these areas, but you just need to be able to uh, have, you need to be, you still need to have like a passing knowledge uh, of all these different sp disciplines. So if you are a generalist, you tend to be uh, somebody who can be deployed into most of these uh, scenarios. Uh, so yes. Right, so those are sort of the different uh, hats programmers wear, if you're a generalist. But otherwise, those are different uh, disciplines that you can specialize in as you grow. Uh, but right now, I, I understand that most of you are still in college, but what? But that is still a lot that you can do as students. Uh, expand your horizons, learn from GDC talks, attend NASCAR events, yes, please be safe, uh, virtual events only. Uh, the, so these conferences are basically where I have met quite a few people, quite a few fellow game developers. Uh, they are a very good opportunity to take, to get a snapshot of what the game development scene in India is right now. Uh, you can go to one of these events, you can meet developers, you can talk to, you, you can make friends, you can see other fellow students who are, uh, who are, who are engineering students who, who might be looking to partner up with someone to make games. So do uh, make full use of the community 
there is a vibrant community out there. If you want to make games and if you are very serious about it, please go talk to them. They will definitely help you out. I should probably say we will definitely help you out. <laughs> okay. And now when it comes to what you need to know, right? So algorithms, data structures, operating systems, matrix math, vector math, physics. So algorithms and data structures, there's absolutely no running away from it. Uh, if you are, if you want to find yourself working in a, uh, if you find, if you want to find yourself working as a programmer in the game development industry, uh, mind you, you, we still need to deliver visuals at 60 frames per second, at least, right? I mean, of course, yeah, uh, we do have uh, displays at least 175 and even more, but, uh, at the very least, we want to be able to re render a HD image at 60 FPS. And that gives you what roughly 16 and a half milliseconds for you to update the world, have all the physics calculations, have all the uh, drawing calculations and everything happen and to draw. So you have to work within the 16 and 16.6 .6 millisecond uh, limit. Of course, each instruction will probably be executed in a nanosecond and you do have quite a bit of wiggle room, but at the, you, you find yourself losing that wiggle room the more you write unoptimized code. So you need to be on top of your game when it comes to algorithms, data structures. Uh, operating systems is also, uh, knowledge of operating systems is also very important because it's not too hard to get to a point where you've badly managed memory and now your uh, virtual memory, you're running out of virtual memory and there's constant thrashing happening. Uh, it's something that happens more often than not when you're working with a game. And when you're working with a system that actually requires this high level of uh, uh, speed. <laughs> yes. And then uh, matrix math and vector math. Uh, matrix math is extremely important because uh, most of these transformations that you do, if, you, if something's moving from A to B, you don't say, okay, let's increase its position by this, X coordinate by this, Y coordinate by that. No, you, you create a translation matrix and then you apply, you handle all the math as vector math. You want to have, you want to rotate something by something? Okay, create a, a rotation matrix. And then that's how it is uh, done at the very lowest level. Uh, vector math is also something that's incredibly important because you are going to be doing, you're, you're going to be dealing with a lot of mathematics because uh, uh, take a simple example of being able to know when a uh, projectile has actually hit a uh, hit, uh, player, right? So you need to know how to figure out how a line and a plane actually meet. So that is, that is absolutely no running away from vector math, your, your 12 standard vector math, even when you're working on uh, games 10 years down the line. Uh, and yes, a working understanding of physics is something that actually, uh, that, that can actually do you a lot of good. Um, knowing what, how inertia and collisions, how they actually affect systems and what changes to specific values and parameters on will ha will do to a world that you're building and stuff. So physics, Newtonian physics, basically, is it's also something that is uh, very good to have. <laughs> Next, uh, it's I would say you need to work on your soft skills. Your soft skills are, I would say, crucial. You can be the best programmer in the world, but if you cannot learn to communicate effectively and if you, if you can't work properly with someone else, you are not going to be able to uh, contribute as much as you want to to a game. Uh, so you don't want to be in a position where you have so much more to offer, but you just can't. That's a very painful position to be in. So please work on your soft skills. Uh, and this sort of extends to the way you uh, name your variables even how you name your variables and your functions, because your code might be, uh, I don't know, somebody who, your, your fellow colleague might be somebody who's worked in Russia before or Japan. They should be able to get a little, uh, they should be able to get an idea of what you meant by 
a specific function of a variable name. Uh, yes, collaboration is something that you can start working on right away. Uh, if you are serious about making games, go out there, you can find people who are like-minded and you can start building these games as you, uh, as you progress through your engineering uh, course. And then yes, play lots of games. Like more often than not, a lot, I find myself in a position where people are referring to other implementations in games. It's just so much more easier to say, okay, you know what, this, this, uh, this effect looks really good, but do you remember that effect from that game? What if we made it a little bit more like that? So being able to have a vast uh, repertoire of games and knowledge that you can draw from is very useful. And sometimes you, as a programmer, you, you find yourself contributing to more than just the uh, realization of games as code. You do find yourself occasionally talking to designers and stuff. And sometimes you do have an opportunity to literally put your signature on a game. You can say, hey, I, I am a programmer, but I did influence that specific decision that, that made my game so successful or whatever. Yes, and there isn't really a bad kind of game to play or a good kind of game to play. And it's not like only these are games or only those are games. I went from blowing up tanks to playing Candy Crush, uh, to working on Candy Crush. So there isn't really a good uh, game or a bad game per se. Uh, and be very open-minded about games. Games are for everyone. Uh, you can find that a lot of people are uh, putting focus on accessibility features for games. Uh, and th that is something that's very beautiful to see. Uh, and yes, last but not least, never stop learning. The learning does not end. I still have a, I still have at least 10 books that I picked up this year that I haven't been, that I haven't really finished yet. Uh, and that's just this year. So the learning never stops. There are plenty of resources out there, lots of learning and yeah. Lastly, work on your own projects. Nothing works as good as a portfolio, right? So if, if you are trying to get a job in the game development industry, nothing is better than a portfolio. You can say, hey, I ship those games. Then the recruiter or the people who, are, who you are talking to will have an idea of what you are uh, capable of just by playing those games or just having a taking a look at what all went into the game. Uh, let me give you a, does this game make, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this, but this is something that was released by a bunch of DigiPen students. I'm going to, by a bunch of DigiPen students. So what they did was when they were working, they worked on this game and then they released it right before uh, they, uh, passed out. So Valve, one of the Valve designers happened to attend this conference where they were showcasing this uh, game and they fell in love with the game almost immediately. Uh, they went back to Steve, I'm sorry, to Gabe Newell, who is the CEO of Valve. And he saw this, he played it and he made offers on the spot for the, for the developers of this game. And mind you, these are kids who just went, who just, uh, who are, who just finished college. Uh, and then Valve took this project in this state and they released what we all know and love today as Portal. And Portal is an iconic title that has just set the bar in terms of puzzle platformers. So yes, that's, basically what I had to say for you, to you guys today. Do you, uh, and I probably should have mentioned this a little earlier. Uh, uh, yeah, we can open it for questions if anybody has any questions or. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, for such an, enli uh, for enlightening us with such a fruitful and a fabulous session. We know in a short span of time, he took us through the entire game industry in a glance. Uh, ranging from audio, video programming, script writing, AI programming, etc. So now it's the time for Q&A. 
so if any participants who have any queries or doubts about today's session uh, now can put it up in the chat box or you can directly ask to the resource person by unmuting your mic so yes i guess there is our first question uh, from adul krishna uh, the question is what is the best way to learn game development and should i just try focusing on a specific discipline from the ones which you showed us okay so that, that's that's actually a very good question so it helps to have a working uh, a fundamental working understand uh, understanding of uh, how a game is actually structured first so i would say start slow don't start don't dive right into uh, you know making building your own rendering engine or whatever that's not going to be helpful at all uh, understand what how uh, how games are usually structured like what is the whole flow from input to actually being able to see something on screen then you start focusing on uh specialization and uh one thing that i can tell you is there are a lot of open source projects out there right uh one good example would be 0 ad uh, and super mario chronicles uh that's m a r y o uh and of course doom has its code open source today so you can go take a look at all these projects and maybe uh involve yourself in some of these projects and you might that might be a really good starting point if you want to start specializing early i hope that answered your question okay yes okay, thank, thank you, you for answering sir so our second question is from ajay das which pro programming to create a game is any of software i think i lost you in between but am i audible am i i think i have a problem with my internet am i yes, still audible yes sir you are audible okay cool so, so can you please repeat the question i'll read you once more okay okay uh, which programming language is to be used to create a game or is it any kind of software okay um uh, that's a it will depend on what you call software so you can have something that you can have a game engine like unity or unreal right you can you might call that software so if that is the case yes you can use software to create other software which is games but for the most part uh you that it's not like there's just one key programming language that you need to learn to uh help that 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 will let you create games uh i like to consider myself to be programming language agnostic so i i have like a functioning idea of how these systems work and i don't necessarily need to be need to know only one specific language or uh, it's not like i specialize in only one specific language so that has let me trans uh, move from uh, coding in objective c early in my career to uh, making games with uh, javascript and uh more recently uh, all my development has been with c++ and when working on unity i did use c sharp as well so don't commit yourself to a specific programming language uh be programming language agnostic but understand these principles figure out i mean have a very good idea of what goes underneath the hood but yes if you are looking to make a quick uh if you want to you know get your feet a little wet uh then you can try out unity or unreal even but i would definitely say go with unity you might get a feel for what game development might be but that is it's still so far away from what actual game development looks like so yes so we have question. next question yes thank you sir uh free softwares to make games free software to make games uh yes there are plenty of uh hmm okay when you say free software to make games you could either be talking about free uh, engines that are free and open uh one engine that's free and open and i have quite a bit of experience working on is goku studio x right so that is free and open it's a 2d engine and at least it was 2d i think they were planning on extending it to 3d use cases also but yes uh coco studio x is 
something that you can use. Uh, you write most of your code in C++, but you, it's a cross-compilable framework. So you can build for iOS, Android, and other platforms also, OS X and Windows also. Uh, what are the other free tools you might need? Um, one free tool that I think you could use is Blender. I mean, Blender in itself, it does have, it, have a little bit of scripting capability. So Blender is also something worth looking into. But I wouldn't touch Blender if you're not serious about 3D asset development and stuff. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, sir. So next question is from Vishnu Prasad Manon. Can you tell a bit about cross-platform games, like games which are available on PC, PS4, Xbox, etc.? Is it difficult to make a game available on a new platform which was originally designed for another platform? What would be the challenges faced in doing so? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. And OK, so you, we did mention about uh, the different uh, engines that, that go into making games, right? So forget engines. There are, so at the end of the day, you are creating software that needs to be deployed on a specific hardware platform, right? So there could be very specific cases where uh, your optimizations and your uh, the code that you actually written for is specifically for a specific uh, processor. The, PS3 had the cell processor, and that was an incredibly notorious uh, processor to actually code for. So being able to port all that code to a different, uh, different hardware implementation was near impossible, which is why you didn't really have too many games on the PS3 that were actually released simultaneously on so many different platforms. Uh, but there, uh, but it's not. It wasn't impossible back then either. But there are quite a few challenges, and the challenges usually have to do with the final target hardware platform that you've used, and whether your code, if it's easy to port to something else, is that okay, sir? A fair okay. answer. <laughs> yes, sir. So next question is from Srihari. Or which are the game development softwares to learn about AI in the games as a beginner? Hmm. Uh, I would say stick to your AI papers for now. You probably have a paper in AI if you are in if you are a computer science student. So I still find practical applications for things like A star. I within the last three years I've definitely implemented A star over a network and. Uh, Definitely take a look at those uh, the approaches that uh, the AI th th those AI papers talk about. I mean, it's been a very long time. I don't exactly remember what they were, but uh, there's dynamic programming, and all all of them are different approaches to solve some of these problems. And I do find applications for that in game dev, left, right, and center. So start there, focus on that, and then you can actually take take a look at uh, uh there is a plugin for unity called behavior designer right uh that is something that lets you create uh behavior trees and you can start messing with behavior trees at that point if you want but behavior trees are still not as uh crucial to your understanding of ai as your ai subjects are yeah i'm done so our next question, how does the knowledge about animation helps a person to develop a good game? OK, so if you are an animator, right, or if you have a proper understanding of animation, then you should probably work with a programmer, right? That, that's the collaboration bit that I was talking about. So you, your skills as an animator is, so you can focus on your skills as an animator. And you can work with other uh programmers to make your vision of a game come true uh there are plenty of jobs for animators and uh animators are definitely sought out, sought out uh in the industry so that's one thing that i can say but uh, apart from that uh, i think as an animator you might have a very good understanding of uh frame rates and how key and uh, how 
animations are sort of interpolated from keyframes, how you create an animation from keyframes. So that is knowledge that you can actually use when programming, say, a 3D animation uh, implementation, right? So something that animates 3D objects. So that can be something that you can contribute to. But I'm not sure if, as an animator, you can find a solid pro programming roles. But as an animator, you can contribute to animations. Yes, sir. Thank you. So next question is from Sri Hari. Can we expect any feature like DLSS in the mobile phones? Hmm. Uh, DLSS, for those who don't know, is uh, deep learning super sampling. I hope I got that right. <laughs> but yeah, basically what happens there is the, the old... So like I said earlier, right? you are expected to run a full HD screen worth of... You're expected to come out with a full HD screen worth of... Uh, uh images right uh every one every 16 milliseconds uh so the drawing process might get a little a little uh tedious depending on how complex your scene is so games what they do is they tend to you might but you might have a 4k screen right and you might want to see your visuals at 60 fps also so games, what they do is they use deep learning to blow up a small uh, small rendering, right? So basically what you're doing is you are stretching a HD image to 4K. So that is something that's uh, basically very new, relatively new, when you uh, think about it. So the kind of deep learning... Uh, mm, the amount of muscle power, right? Processing muscle power required to actually pull this off on a mobile soft on a mobile platform looks uh, to be. I, I think it's next to impossible to pull that off on a mobile plot platform for the next for, for the foreseeable future, anyways. But maybe in the future, once we have once the once the LSS as a technology matures, and once we have more number crunching. Uh, capabilities on a mobile, definitely, it's, it is a possibility. Yes, sir. So next question from Meka Shyam. Should I start learning games by using a game engine like Unity, or should I make from scratch? OK, that's, a good, good, that, that, that's actually a good question. So you can, when you say from scratch, right, you could be talking about going into the details of how you construct a window, how you capture your screen, right? It's called capturing a screen, being able to see something in full screen. So the, all that is like incredibly complex and pretty hard for you to uh, start off with. I would definitely recommend taking the route of either working on games that already exist, like open source projects, right? You can actually go take a look at uh, those games that I mentioned earlier, Super Mario Chronicles, I'm not even sure if these are still being maintained right now. So that's one thing. Uh, and there might be newer and better options to look at also. So uh, take a look at these games, see what you like within this, uh, within those projects, uh, if there's an area that interests you. And that's one option. The other option is for you, if you want to build something from uh, something that you want to, if there's a specific concept that you want to turn into a game, then I would recommend definitely using Unity or definitely stick to Unity for now uh, for uh, you know quickly coming out with a prototype that you can run on your phone and show your friends. So yes. So sir, we are moving to our last question from mm -hmm. uh, Steve Austin. Uh, so while working in the game industry, each employee would be having a specific job rules, right? So could you point out a few good roles that we can aspire? Hmm. OK. Uh, OK, so some of the job roles, per se, uh, are what we spoke about earlier in the presentation. So once, as an engineer, right, you are probably going to be involved, interested in programming. OK? That, it's, I'm just assuming it. So you're probably going to be interested in programming. If that is the case, that you can definitely start off as 
uh, trainee engineer or an associate software developer at any one of these at, at, at these companies. Uh, there are plenty of good companies to start your career at in uh, India. Uh, now, job roles per se, depending on what you want to do within the industry, I would definitely, uh, depending on what you want to do, what makes you happy is something that you should ask yourself. Does making, uh, does 3D modeling make you happy? Then you should definitely go and apply for 3D modeling roles. But the thing is, you guys are already engineers, and I'm guessing I'm speaking to 100 plus engineers right now. Uh, most of you are going to have a, a bit of a disadvantage because you will be competing against people who are who've spent the last three years of their lives uh, earning a degree in art or animation. So unless you have a portfolio that's solid, uh, I would not recommend uh, changing streams. Otherwise, you can go go ahead and study and change your path if that's what you want. But uh, Yes, uh, the job role that you would all, always go for is probably the associate software engineer or trainee software engineer or an intern, and you would go grow higher. But I'm guessing I missed some aspect of your question, but I hope I answered, <laughs> answered that, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, we have one more question, I think. Uh, can you say a few words on game modding? Uh, game modding, yeah. <sighs> okay, so modding is also another way to learn, but the way... Okay, so game modding. So what are mods? Mods are basically uh, modifications to the game that the uh, original uh, developer has shipped. So you might be replacing few assets uh, like you can get your player to look like something else if you replace the uh, the file that the game looks for with the corresponding file uh, and there are lots of other mods also that you can do that directly impact gameplay uh, this is also a very good way to actually uh, you know understand how your actions can have consequences within the game. So uh, yes, modding is also a good start, but I wouldn't say that it's actually a great way to become a great game programmer per se. But if you are somebody who is into design and stuff, uh, then yes, modding plays a very good uh, modding can actually land you jobs if you are a designer or an artist, if you you know created a specific mod that actually a lot of people play, then if, if, if you created a popular mod, then yes, it's definitely possible. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, so this is uh, our Q and session has over. Uh, so thank you, sir, for answering all the queries, and I guess all have got their answers. Uh, so can we share your contact info, your LinkedIn profile for further queries? Uh, sure. Okay. okay, sir. Uh, so now I invite Justin, sir, for consolidating the event. Thank you, sir, for giving such a nice section regarding this gaming industry. Some of the key points to be consolidated are this uh, game programming disciplines. You have mentioned regarding this game program discipline, like this artificial intelligence, then importance of physics, then graphics, how how all these things is to be worked out. Then the most of the audience are from the students side and how these students can implement all those things is also you have mentioned. Then finally, a uh, lot of interesting questions from the audience side also. You have replied to all the questions in a very beautiful way. So thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. It's thank a pleasure you, to be here. Uh, so uh, now let me invite Krishna Prasad to deliver the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Akansha. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So good evening, everyone. My name is Krishna Prasad, and, and I'm the CTO of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Cell of Christ College of Engineering. Uh, 
and i am extremely honored uh, to have been given the task of giving the vote of thanks for such a momentous occasion such as the fourth day of leap that is learn from the professionals so let me start off by giving my thanks to our professional for the day bharat mr bharat so first of all i'd like to appreciate your enthusiasm in becoming the resource person for this event like the day i reached out to you like without any hesitation you just said okay just tell the date and time and the topic i'll be there so hats off to you for that and then i'm pretty sure you gave a really great and concise idea about the gaming industry that would have really helped all the students and then the what can the students do part also seemed extremely useful and i'm sure it will get any uh, all of the determined uh, game programmers that are there in the meeting right now to make their mark in the gaming industry so thank you so much bro bro for being a part of the session and let's say like to thank our executive director father john palikara i'd also like to thank our principal dr sajee john sir and i like thank the nodal officer of idc rahul manohar sir all the executive uh, student committee members and everyone who has worked for the success of this program and last but not least i'd like to thank all the participants who were part of this event i hope you guys found it useful and be sure to check into our next event tomorrow that is day 5 of leap now before we leave actually we have a surprise arranged for you but bro so as a token of appreciation one of our uh, iedc members anson has made a portrait for you i'll be presenting it right now uh the presentation will be showing up soon okay so one of the iedc members anson has made this portrait for you so please accept it as a token of gratitude for presenting such an amazing session oh wow thank you i am <laughs> beyond honored thank you anson that, that that's that's me yeah <laughs> beautiful <laughs> okay so i guess we'll uh, we are coming to the end of the session again sir yes uh, so once again thank you bharat sir for such an informative and descriptive session and thank you for being with us today uh, thank you before leaving participants kindly fill the feedback form given in the chat box So all the participants